and it's my great pleasure to welcome you here tonight as well as to commend you those of you who have come now for the third lecture in a very challenging and provocative series uh, we hope to see you again in future years uh, next year we have a fascinating set of lectures to be given by Professor Paula Hyman of Yale. But tonight, we have our third and final lecture by Professor Moshe Idel of the Hebrew University. And let me say just on a personal note that it's been uh, a great pleasure for me and for the entire Jewish Studies program to have Professor Idel here, not only for the intellectual stimulation that he's provided, but also for his good cheer and his friendship. Professor Idel has been speaking on Pardes, the quest for spiritual paradise in Judaism. And the uh, starting point of his lectures has been a, um, an ancient text from Tosefta Chagiga, which starts as follows. Four entered the orchard, which is Pardes, Ben Azai, Ben Zoma, Acher, and Rabbi Akiva. One peaked and died, one peaked and was smitten, one peaked and cut down the shoots, one ascended safely and descended safely. The first lecture, Primordial Wisdom, the Philosopher's Quest, used the paradigm of Rabbi Akiva he who ascended safely and descended safely, to talk about Maimonides in the Middle Ages and how he understood the entry into Pardes as the attempt to harness and quell the impulses and lust and passions of the human so that he could be a purely intellectual being and in that realm of intellectuality, as expressed through the um, Aristotelian metaphysics, this person could enter the true pardes or paradise. In the second lecture, Primordial Light, the Ecstatic's Quest, we saw a very different medieval interpretation. The ecstatics were ones who understood the pardes in terms of the shekhinah or light and the um, unification of the ecstatic with the uh, heavenly light in a totally mystical experience. Tonight, the third lecture, we are going to hear about pardes between spirot and demonology. Professor Idel. Let me help you with this. Tonight I shall explore two different paradigms which informed the most important uh, trend of Kabbalah, the theosophical theological Kabbalah. I shall start at the beginning with a comparison between the two earlier or two paradigms discussed in the first two lectures, and what they have in common is the fact that uh, both of them deal with an inner experience. This inner experience may be intellectual, intellectualistic, like in the case of Maimonides, or the philosophical one, or it can be an ecstatic, as in the case of the more neoplatonic type of uh, interpretation of the parties, but in the two cases, the drama takes place in the innerness of the human consciousness. Even if we understand the ecstasy as a possession, nevertheless, the major arena is the human consciousness. Another common denominator is the fact that the divine is not affected by the entrance of the mystic or of the philosopher in the Pardes. That's to say, doesn't matter what type of activity someone will 
uh, enjoy, that to say, Aristotelian contemplation, neoplatonic ecstasy, this type of activity is going to affect only the intellect or the human soul, but not the divine. Today I shall discuss two paradigms that are based upon the assumption that entering the Pardes is an activity which has a deep effect upon the external, non-human realm. So we shall discuss two major paradigms. One is the theosophical one, namely the assumption that the divine is not at one simple entity, but a system of divine power which are found in an ongoing process of changes, or changing and changes. And entering the Pardes amounts to a certain type of influence or impact on the divine. And the other paradigm has to do with the encounter or the descent of the mystique to the demonic realm and the attempt to influence or to struggle to combat the, the demonic realm. Prima facie, it seems that we have two totally different types of activities, but basically that's not the fact. According to the Kabbalah, or, to, or the major uh, trend in Kabbalah, the demonic and the divine share one basic structure, and that's the, I would say, anthropomorphic structure. To say, the ten sefirot, which form the divine role, are, if you like, the prototype or the, or the archetype of the structure that is informing also the demonic world. And in one way or another, we have, if you like, the essence, the divine, and the ape, the, the demonic world. But in the two cases, we deal with attempts of the individual to structure external entities. To enter the Pardes is now to attempt to induce harmony in the divine world, or on the contrary, to combat some aspects of the demonic world. This is why we can speak again about a dangerous zone, because in the two cases, we'll see that the danger is much greater than the possibility to improve or to contribute to the two zones. Two of them are too strong for most of them uh, mortals. We shall contemplate basically the figure of uh, a third of the protagonists of the Pardes story, the figure of Elisha Benabuya, better named Elisha Acher, or simply Acher, is to say that figure who is considered to be the heretic, someone who was unable to understand in an appropriate manner either the sephirotic realm or the demonic one. So I shall start with discussing the more demonic uh, aspect in order to finish with something that's a little bit more positive. Now, uh, the basic assumption of uh, one trend of Kabbalah, which uh, became very important at the end of the 13th, 13th century, that's the idea that is not found at the beginning of Kabbalah, but only later on, is that the knowledge of the structure of the demonic is the most profound form of Kabbalah. To say to understand the spherotic realm or the divine realm, I would say it may be an advanced form of Kabbalah, but for sure it's not the more profound one. To understand really the dimension of evil in the world is to penetrate 
the most recondite, if you like, aspect of reality. And this is why those Kabbalists involved in the study of the demonic realm were called in Hebrew, Ma'amikim. It can be translated as the more profound Kabbalists. Together with uh, detailed exposition of the structure of the demonic realm, namely long list of uh, the pernicious angels and uh, uh, let's say relationship between the demonic world and the divine one. Together with this type of speculation, we have also a strong reinterpretation of the Pardé story, which assumes that it is a religious duty, and I emphasize it, it's a religious duty to know and to pursue the knowledge of the demonic world, but not to be immersed in it. That's the starting point. In the writings of Moses de Leon, one of the most important Kabbalists in the 13th century, we have this assumption that it's part of the religious knowledge to be able to distinguish between good and evil. Because if you are unable to distinguish, you cannot worship God. You can worship only when you are able to differentiate between good and evil. However, it must be done in such a way that you will not be attracted by the demonic one, or you will not be immersed in the demonic. However, that's a challenge that cannot be met by most of the great figures in the biblical and post-biblical uh, Judaism. And this is why, for example, we have a long list of sinners, if you like, starting with primordial men, with Adam, and going through Solomon, for example. In a moment, I shall explain why Solomon, and then Bilam, Balaam, and the last major figure being Elisha Acher. The common denominators of, of all of them was that they were attracted by the demonic realm and they were induced in a sexual sin. As I say, the attraction is of a very specific nature. It's being immersed in a certain type of commerce or intercourse with demonic, I would say, feminine figures. We start with uh, Adam in the Midrash, who had as his spouse Lilith, one major view of the Midrash. And then we are moving to Solomon, who had thousand wives, interpreted by the Kabbalists as being representative of demonic power. And so we move up to Bilam, Balam, who has intercourse with his ass, and etc. Uh, always in this case, we are speaking about people who attempted to understand, but they were seduced so that they became sinners. So the problem is the attraction, the sexual attraction, is basically the explanation of the Pardes. But this, that's a place where you are supposed to understand, but not to be immersed in. Before entering in some details, I shall try to expose what seems to me to be the background. Why, at the end of the 13th century, we have such an interpretation of uh, Partes as sexual sin related to demonic power. Most of the Kabbalists who exposed this view were living in Castile. And according to several evidence, types of pieces of evidence from the last decades of the 13th century, there was a certain phenomenon of uh, Jews having sexual relationship with Christian, but basically masculine, uh, persons. 
just a series, we have a series of discussions found inter alia and Moses de Leon, but also in uh, maybe the most important figure in Castilian Kabbalah and leadership at the same time in this uh, period, Rabbi Todro Salevia Bulafia, he was the leader of uh, Castilian Jewry. We have a sermon of his dedicated to this idea. The attraction or the fascination with the other was transformed, in my opinion, by the Kabbalists in such a way that it was portrayed to be a demonic attraction. And instead of being acquainted with, people were immersed in. The basic pattern which informs the demonic attraction of the Pardes is to be related to a concept which is well known in religious studies named katabasis. That is to say, to enter, to descend to the underworld or to the hell in order to perform a certain type of rite is well known from antiquity. Uh, however, in most of the parallel concepts, katabasis, the descent to the underworld in order to save some inhabitants, I won't say sinners, but some inhabitants dwelling there, in most of the cases, like in the Christian one, the katabasis is always I would say, uh, ending in a rather positive manner. What's interesting in Kabbalah that we have in this idea of descending to the demonic, into the demonic, we have on one side the positive end, in a moment I shall describe it, but what's real interesting is the negative part. People are unable to surface after they enter such a type of demonic role. And that's the tragic figure of uh, Acher, or Elisha ben Abuya, who was described already in the Talmud as having some type of relationship with a prostitute. That's found in the Talmudic development or elaboration of our uh, Pardes story. But what happened in Kabbalah, Kabbalah exploited, I would say, one brief statement in order to portray him like Adam and like uh, Solomon as indulging in sexual transgression. The other, the other figures uh, who entered in Pardes were portrayed much more, I would say, successfully. Uh, for example, uh, Rabbi Akiva was able to enter the exploration of the Pardes as demonic, a demonic realm, but he was not involved in it. And parallel to Rabbi Akiva, we have in the biblical story, we have Abraham. Abraham was portrayed as descending to Egypt, which was portrayed by the Kabbalists to be the demonic sphere, and able afterwards to emerge in peace from Egypt. Uh, or the other example is uh, Noah, who also was able to descend in this flood and to ascend safely. What's important in this type of interpretation is that we have a typological approach. Basically, the Pardes is not a story which took place in second, third century, but that's really a certain type of, I would say, prototypical experiences, which start with the paradise story, and they are running up to the Tanaitic figures, but in principle, in my opinion, also to the 13th century interpretation of the relationship between Jews and the Gentiles. That's to say, this type of reading, it's a reading which uh, is much more obviously 
interested in typological reading. Here, it's obvious that we have a typological interpretation because we can see a whole range of figures which are brought or abused in order to make the point. Biblical, and in a moment I shall discuss a little bit more, and then Tanaitic figures. The most uh, exciting part of this interpretation, in my opinion, is something that has nothing to do with the Pardes, but it's, I would say, a projection of the Pardes on a, a biblical story which uh, apparently has nothing to do with this issue. And that's the episode of um, Samson. An interesting, I would say, use of this type of interpretation, the demonic part, is the reading of Samson as being able, at the beginning, to enter a certain relation with uh, Delilah and ultimately to destroy the realm of evil. And you may ask, what is the Pardes in the Samson story? The answer is rather obvious. He met, according to the Kabbalists, according to the Bible, he met Delilah in what's called in Hebrew, Keren, another term for Pardes. So according to the Kabbalists, I must say it's a long discussion, which is rather fascinating to see how the typology works. The Pardes story is hinted already, not only in the Paradise story, but also in the story of the meeting uh, in a, a vineyard between, a vineyard between uh, Samson and Delilah. To say, what we have in this type of interpretation it's a strong typological approach. And in my opinion, we can use the Pardes story according to this type of reading in order to show that Jewish medieval hermeneutics was very fond of typological interpretation. To say the major assumption in modern scholarship is that uh, Jewish hermeneutics was, was a little bit, I would say, indifferent if not reluctant, to typological interpretations which were basically cultivated by the scholastic uh, hermeneutics. But in the case of the Pardes, we can see easily how this idea of the typos, starting with Adam, Balaam, Samson, Elisha, are in one way or another prefiguring the basic type of of um, the sin, the sin of being involved in a commerce with uh, the demonic world. This type of interpretation is uh, strong, strongly evident at the end of the 13th century, but it uh, runs up to the Luriani Kabbalah, where indeed, uh, it reached one of its uh, apexes, but again, I cannot enter in too many details. I would like to move now to the other type of paradigm, and that's the paradigm of the Sephirotic realm. The Kabbalists assume, the Kabbalists assume that uh, the crucial issue related to Pardes is the need to induce or reinduce the harmony that was disturbed by human transgression. According to the Kabbalists, uh, there are too many, or two, excuse me, two main avenues open to describe the divine wo uh, world using uh, metaphors. One is using the metaphor of the tree, that's to say the sephirotic realm is arranged as a tree, that's, that's more of a vegetable type of uh, symbolism. And the other one is to use the more anthropomorphic metaphors in order to describe the divine realm as a couple. I'm 
simplifying very much, I said, a couple of male and female, while the first nine sefirot are the male world, Olam Azahar in Hebrew, that's exactly the term, while the last manifestation, the last divine manifestation, the Shekhinah, represents the female world, one. The basic sin of Acher was to induce a separation in this divine world, either between the last Sfira as a fruit in comparison to the tree, or between the last Sfira as a female figure in comparison to the whole spherotic crown, which, is, uh, which consists of a male figure. So the basic transgression and the basic challenge of the Pardes story is to see, according to one device, to see the Pardes as really as a garden. And here we return to the idea of the paradise. What happens in paradise, according to the Bible already, we have the separation of a certain entity, a fruit, from a tree. Now, this transgression, this primordial transgression was uh, projected on the high. As to say, according to such a reading, the transgression of Eve was not merely eating something, but separating one aspect of the divine from another one. That is the metaphorical, symbolical reading of the Kabbalists. And again, we have another formulation, if you like, of the Kabbalistic fascination with the erotic. Uh, according to the other typology, the typology of men and female, by separating the fruit from the tree, the Kabbalist, or Elisha Acher, or Adam, separated again the divine realm, and the, this, I'd say the theological implication of such a separation is a double one. One, that by separating, we are inducing a certain disturbance in the divine realm, something that was organically unified, was separated, what's called in the Talmudic uh, term, and later on, kitsut ben kiyot, as to say, the separation of the shots of your life, the devastation of the plantations, however you like to translate it, uh, the assumption is that you are inducing a certain disharmony in an har harmonious world. However, even more dangerous is, according to this type of Kabbalah, following the Talmudic uh, version of Pardes, that by affecting the divine world, you are prone to accept the assumption of two different powers. By the division we induce, or the Kabbalist, or the sinner, if you like, induces in the divine realm, he is prone afterwards to believe that on the high there is no one unity, a dynamic unity, but actually there is a duality. And this is the way the Kabbalists understood the implication of separating the two uh, entities on the high. Doesn't matter how we're going to express them by vegetal or more organic metaphors. Always the assumption is that in the moment you are separating, you are building up the possibility of a dualistic misunderstanding of reality. And this is why the real chain challenge of, of the Jews 
and now we're entering another important issue, is how to restore this disruption or rupture in the divine. As I say, the rupture took place in the primordial time, already with uh, Adam, already, if you like, with Achaia. But there is a way to restore the lost unity, and this avenue is open to the Jews in general, but especially to the Kabbalists. The assumption is that by the Jewish ritual, it's possible to reintegrate the two divided powers. Here we can see how the Jewish ritual was strongly reinterpreted in order to expose a certain theurgical technique, that's to say a technique which is able to influence God. That's one way to interpret the term theurgy. And uh, according to the Theosophical Theological Kabbalah, the major role of a Kabbalist is to restore the organic unity between the divine powers. Here we can see how the ritual was understood not only as important for the inner spiritual or human life, but it was transposed on a totally different key where the primary object of the ritual is not to induce a certain type of human or intellectual calmness or certain preparation for a higher type of human experience, but the ritual is trying to repair the rupture induced by uh, human transgression. As you say, people like Rabbi Akiva were presented now not as someone who reached the apex of human intellectual achievement or perfection, or as someone who was able to enter an ecstatic experience to return safely but someone who is able basically to act ritualistically in such a manner as to restore the uh, relationship between the two divine manifestations, the two last sefirot. Uh, this reading of Jewish uh, ritual is of paramount interest because it projected a certain type of sacramental value to Jewish ritual, which is absent in, in the other forms of Kabbalah I discussed, in the ecstatical one or in the intellectualistic approach of Maimonides. There, Kabbalah is basically a way, Kabbalah and philosophy, a way to describe human perfection. The individual is the center, while in the, the form of Kabbalah, in the demo, demonic and in the divine type of uh, patterns, in two cases, what the major focus of the Kabbalistic activity is, I would say, uh, the divine or the demonic, but the implication is that we are inducing by subduing the demonic and repairing the divine. We are inducing a more harmonious state in general, as you say, not only on the divine realm, but also on the national and on the, on the cosmical realm. As you say, Kabbalah is perceived now not as a means for a personal achievement, but of, I would say, an harmony that transcends any individual faith. Let me move now to the last issue, and that's a comparative observation as to the distribution of discussions of Pardes story. The Pardes story is found 
in the Talmud and in Tosefta and the Haaret literature and in ancient literature. When we inspect who was interested in this story in medieval period, the answer, surprisingly enough, even for me, before I wrote the, let the, the lectures, I couldn't give such an answer. And I wouldn't believe that there's the answer. But the answer is definitively only the Sephardi Jewry. As I say, it's very difficult to find any of the four patterns, not only one of them, not only most of them, any of them, in the rich literature written by the Ashkenazi community in medieval period and even later on. I shall discuss later on in a moment. As I say, the Ashkenazi literature, which was based on the Talmud, could refer to this story in one way or another. Or the Ashkenazi mystical literature, named Hasidic Ashkenaz, who was based, which was based upon the Echalot literature, with this idea of ecstasy, had to address the idea of the Pardes, and nevertheless, there are no, I would say, interpretations of the Pardes story. On the other side, we have the Sephardi literature, which was less interested in the Talmud, and less interested in the Echalot literature, which is fascinated with the Pardes story. And basically, the Sephardi jury invented the four, I would say, patterns of interpretation. So attempting to answer this question, what happened here, I came up with a certain type of sociological, cultural, I would say, explanation, that the Sephardi culture, which was in contact, much more open and much more dynamic, was basically endangered by the alien types of culture. As I say, the deep influence of uh, the masculine culture and here and there also of, uh, I would say, Christian type of uh, since the 14th century, of philosophical scholastic culture, was perceived by the Sephardi themselves as a certain type of danger. They, they, their openness and their readiness to accept was conceived also or understood also as a danger. And they had to address the idea of the, what I called in the first lecture the dangerous ideal. As I say, the openness to, the ability to absorb, the possibility to be flexible and to transform was considered at the same time not only as an ideal, but also as a danger. On the other side, the Ashkenazi culture was very close. We don't have real intercourse between Ashkenazi scholars and the Christian one. It was, it was a very confident type of culture. As I say, uh, they were not open enough to accept because their, I would say, self-confidence that the Jewish culture is the highest form of religiosity. And this is why in the Ashkenazi type of um, religiosity, there, are, there was no dangerous ideal. As you say, entering the Pardes didn't answer for them any cultural or religious need. They, they had no need to express a certain type of culture in danger. And this is why it seems to me that we have this interesting distribution between Sephardi literature deeply permitted by this type of dangerous ideal, while the Ashkenazi simply ignored the whole idea of a danger which may be inherent into a certain type of religiosity. Even later on, let's say in the 16th century, since the 16th century, whenever we find 
among Ashkenazi uh, Jewish scholars. Some discussions of the Pardes, all of them are either copied or inspired by Sephardi literature. As to say, even up to the middle 18th century, we don't have, as far as I know, any original Ashkenazi interpretation of the Pardes. However, in the 19th century, late 18th century, early 19th century, we have a deep change. All the interest in the Pardes is found among the Ashkenazi Jewry. Something that can be answered very simply, the Ashkenazi Jewry of the 19th century enters exactly the same type of cultural interaction with the general culture, the Enlightenment, and in order to explain to themselves in, in a rather religious terminology, what's the, what's the meaning of such an interaction with the Christian and general culture, many of the 19th century intellectuals, including uh, writers, return to the idea of Pardes. I would say that Elisha ben Abuya, the outcast or the heretic, is one of the major protagonists of modern Hebrew literature. People who, who writers and also, I would say, even scholars, who were open enough to accept either European literature as a way of expression, or the general scholarly method of the Enlightenment, they return time and again to the idea of Elisha ben Abuya as a figure who represents such type of a dangerous relationship with the environment. And uh, in principle, it seems to me, that we have exactly the same situation, the cultural exposure and the openness of Jewish culture invoked or provoked or evoked, however you like, all of them are okay. Such an interest in the Pardes. The Pardes explained, in my opinion, the, the various encounters between the Jews and other types of mentalities which uh, were propelled in one way or another in the old Talmu Talmudic story. Uh, according to some scholars, that may be also the explanation of the Talmudic uh, treatment of Elisha Her, because if we read Elisha Her as a Gnostic, as some modern scholars do, we have just another example of the encounter between Jewish um, culture and one of the forms of, uh, of uh, general culture, Gnosticism. And indeed, in some types of uh, studies, Elisha is portrayed once as a certain type of Gnostic and then by another scholar, a certain type of Epicurean. Uh, and we have a whole typology trying to explain what was wrong in Elisha. And most of the scholarly interpretation is that the original Elisha, if you like, if you like, this was someone who was open toward a non-Jewish type of culture. The problem is that there are so many types of ancient cultures that we have as many Elishas, as many types of culture we have in the Talmudic period. And I'm speaking about scholarly uh, attempts to interpret it in a rather historical, philological manner. As to say, we can consider the story of Pardes not merely as a way of medieval Jewry to read a certain ancient text for, uh, 
some strange reason, but we can use the different interpretations of uh, the Pardes in order to understand, I would say, the willingness of the Jews, or the, basically the Sephardi and the Italian Jews in the medieval period, to open themselves to what happened in their surrounding, and on the other side, the awareness that such an openness involves a deep danger. And this danger is basically to be unable to return to your religious patrimony, to remain immersed in one way or another in philosophy or in Gnosticism, if we accept a certain reading of uh, Elisha Acher, or in other neoplatonic types of speculation. To say, while, while dealing with a classical Jewish text, most of the medieval major direction of intellectual life were describing basically their existential situation between two worlds, the world of Judaism and the more general culture which attracted them and fascinated them and endangered them. Thank you very much.